we have 149 people online. I think it's time to start. And now this part of our seminar or webinar is in English. And then we have a presentation from Europeana. So Europeana has over the years given us here in Finland inspiration being an example. And we are very happy and lucky that we have been able to work at uh, different uh, groups uh, to to collaborate with Europeana. Europeana Foundation, myself, over the years, been there for perhaps some five, five years. And now at the moment we have uh, at European level, the Digital Cultural Heritage Expert Group. So it's a commission level, high level expert group. And we have three people from Finland who, who are working on this and this high level group is, is uh, steering Europeana. So we have the privilege of following what is happening with Europeana and also we, we can have impact on, on the development. So we are really, really happy to have uh, Europeana and representatives of Europeana here attending our seminar. The topic is caring for culture, creating a sustainable Europeana climate aware, diverse, inclusive. And we have three speakers here. So first of one is executive director, Harry Verweyen. And you can see that he's speaking from uh, perhaps different environment than he originally planned, but he will tell about more sort of when he starts. So I, I looked um, what, uh, what is uh, said about Harry. So Harry likes to design and implement new business models that will change our way of thinking about heritage as an enabler of societal and economic growth. So a strategic thinker. The second speaker here is collections editor Jolan Vajats. And uh, Jolan works to improve collections, visibility, innovate editorial and thematic collection production and support uh, campaigns. And then we have campaign coordinator Marike Everts. And uh, as, as her title says, she is coordinating campaigns and European has quite many of those. And uh, Marike has a background in fine arts and she has spent a year exhibiting art around the Netherlands and one international exhibition in Finland. So you, you know Finland already, that is great. So we are really pleased to have you here and uh, Harry and others, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christina, for, uh, for those nice words. And indeed, uh, our collaboration with Finland goes back, goes back a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, very recently we had the, uh, the Finnish presidency events. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned my situation. Uh, you see me here in my car, um, such as modern life. Uh, we need to be a bit flexible. Uh, I had a bit of an emergency this morning. My dog broke his leg and uh, he's gonna be okay. But I had to improvise a bit, and uh, so here you see me in my car. Uh, but still able to join, thanks to modern technology and the flexibility of the organization. Um, actually, that's, um, that's quite a nice segue into uh, the, the talk we want to, to give you. Um, we call this an exploration talk. Uh, why do we call it that? Um, I think we've come to realize that uh, there are currently many aspects of our business, of the things that we're doing as in digital culture heritage, that we don't have an, a cut and clear answer to. Um, I'm gonna run you through a couple of those, but uh, caring for culture and the sustainable perspectives, that's the title of this, uh, of this conference, certainly fit that, that bill according to us. So we're not gonna pretend that we have all the answers here. Uh, we're gonna show you, um, you know, how we're working ourselves through some of these topics and we, we'd love to engage in the conversation with you later on. So just very quickly and intuitively, uh, when we, we think of diversity and inclusion, a big topic at the moment uh, for all of us, um, let's have a look at, at, at some of the, the key aspects of our work. So 
Europeana has 50 million items um, on our portal. Uh, about a million and a half relates to Finland. So a question we need to ask ourselves is, how diverse is that content and how inclusive is it to also minority voices? Can I have the next slide? Um, our website has just been revamped completely, built up from scratch uh, on a new stack of technology uh, with a shiny new interface. And again, we need to ask ourselves, how diverse and inclusive is this to, for example, people with disabilities? Next slide, please. And equally, uh, these are the people, the talented people in, in our office. Uh, there's about uh, 55 of them at the moment. Um, at a glance, I think you can see it's a, it's a very nice bunch of people um, from 24 different nationalities at the moment. But again, how diverse and inclusive is it to women, to people from different backgrounds? How is that translated into the leadership and into our governance? Next slide, please. Europeana, uh, one of the most interesting things about Europeana is that it's not just an organization, it's also a network, a thriving network of about 3,000 people, uh, of which I hope uh, some of you are a member. And uh, here you see us in uh, Vienna uh, two years ago at our conference. And again, ask ourselves, are we diverse and inclusive enough to people from different backgrounds? So, I think our conclusions on an intuitive level are uh, there's, there's absolutely work to do. And I think uh, what we've seen during the pandemic is that society is really questioning us on these, on these aspects. And it's important if we want to stay relevant to society, and I believe we do, that we, we start addressing these things in a constructive and, and good manner. Can I have the next slide? Um, Yupiana has also uh, started uh, on a new strategy uh, that was uh, published in March uh, last year. Christina was part of the process of setting up this strategy. I think it sounds, uh, next slide please. The key thing there in the, in the strategy is that Europeana, the Europeana initiative will be focusing completely on supporting our sector in what is called their digital transformation now. Um, that is a complicated and complex uh, term uh, that we were still digging into. What does it really mean and how can we support that? But I think one thing I'd like to share with you immediately is that we've come to a very deep realization that digital transformation is really as much about uh, the people as much as the hardware and as much about the processes as about the systems. It's, you know, it's a human affair. So, in June, we started to investigate with our network in a sort of a, a co-creation space uh, you know, to investigate how are you feeling at the moment and what are the things that you're struggling with. And uh, we conducted with 64 people uh, in three week sessions. Um, we conducted workshops, peer to peer workshops where people shared their experiences, which have been bundled in a, uh, I think a very interesting um, uh, research work that you can download on Europeana Pro. Uh, it's got an immense amount of wealth of information about how our sector in Europe has experienced so far the pandemic and what are the things that they struggle with. So there's, there's plenty in there that, uh, that can be explored. Um, we've identified uh, a couple at the foundation that we find both very important and urgent to address. Um, the digital divide uh, is one of the things that I think is coming up very prominently at the moment. Not everyone is as equipped uh, to be present in the digital space as, as the other. So digital divides run through, through Europe between countries. I think Finland is a very advanced country uh, in general, but you may see that even in your own country, some institutions are much better equipped than others. And even within institutions, sometimes you depend on only one or two people who are really well-versed and digital literate and be able to make the right choices. So as part of that, uh, we've, we've set ourselves a goal at the foundation to really figure out how can we be at least more diverse and inclusive in our digital transformation to society. 
So I'm going to leave my introduction to this. Uh, we'll come back later during the conversation, but I've invited two of our most talented people, uh, Jolan Wout and Marijke Everts, to talk you through what we have been doing uh, and what we are doing and the things that we're thinking of at the European Foundation. I'm going to leave you with this statement. Uh, this has been the revised mission statement of the European Foundation. As you can see, we really believe, at least on paper, that uh, diversity is the critical aspect to make our society flourish. We live in a highly polarized society, and we believe it's part of our job to make sure that, that diversity is embraced rather than rejected. So, Jolan, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to bring us up to speed. Thanks so much, Harry, um, and, and thanks for being with us, uh, even in less than ideal circumstances. Um, so that, that was a great introduction, uh, and I think it, it really feeds very well into um, the, the work and the conversations that Marika and I have been having over the past few weeks and months in your piano um, that really come back to this statement. Um, we want to embrace our diversity and flourish, but there are so many questions that that live around that that we haven't figured out yet that we are looking at. So that's also why this was tagged an exploration talk because it really is something that we are exploring. Um, so we want to take you with us on that exploration, um, and we that's why we do have some questions that we wanted to ask you. Um, if you have another device at hand, or if you have uh, another uh, tab in your browser or your phone, please go to menti.com um, because we do want to hear um, from you. Harry talked about digital transformation and um, about transformation within your institution. So we're very interested in knowing um, how much do you feel that your organization has reflected on diversity and inclusivity? Um, so to answer this question, please go to menti.com. And at the top of the slide, there is a code, um, 19.03.781. And if everything is good, you should be able to answer the question there. So um, at your piano, we're also still not very sure, I think, where we are on this scale. Um, we for sure have done some things towards uh, diversity and inclusion, and we'll talk a bit more about that throughout the presentation. Um, so it's very interesting to see where, where you feel that you personally or your institution is, um, uh, is on this scale. So let's wait a few seconds to let the answers come in. Um, it's clear that the, the biggest uh, group of you have said up until now that you have done some work on diversity and inclusion, but not enough. And I, I think that does reflect as well where we are at Irpiana, that there's there's so much more that we can do and so many things that we, uh, that we are working on. Uh, I, I wonder if it ever will be enough, but we'll, we're going in that direction for sure. So either you've done some, but not enough, and uh, another big chunk have said quite a lot, although we can still improve. So we'd love to hear from you um, at, the, at the end of this presentation on what you have already done towards diversity and inclusion, um, what challenges you faced, um, what issues you, you, you solved or that you still want to solve, um, because those are the questions we're posing ourselves as well. Okay, so thank you for voting. Um, please keep your phone at hand because at the end of the presentation, there is another Menti slide. Um, but let's go back to uh, this. Um, so I, I wanted to follow up Harry's introduction a bit with what uh, me and Marijke uh, mostly do. We work in the same team, the collections engagement team, and our mission is that we want to highlight the diversity and richness of Europe's cultural heritage. And we do that by creating engaging editorial. We write blogs, we create galleries, we uh, produce exhibitions, um, we work on campaigns and seasons like Women's History Month, Migration Campaign. Mareka has done, um, has said a lot of work on these campaigns. Um, and we are of ourselves already quite a diverse group of people and we want to create very diverse, engaging editorial. We also create this editorial for a very diverse group. 
we uh, cater to the education community, to the creative community, to the research community, and of course to in general, the, the European public um, that is interested in cultural heritage and, uh, and history. So that's a bit of our background. Um, to talk a bit more about myself, how I came into this, uh, this whole fold of, uh, of working on diversity and inclusion is um, when I had just joined Europeana um, already quite a while ago, I created a few a few pieces of editorial, a few blogs that were about the LGBTQ community. So the first one was um, about uh, drag queens in the Victorian era, uh, which I thought was a, a wonderful topic and became quite a popular blog as well. Um, and so I created a few more blogs about, about LGBTQ communities and about LGBTQ issues. Um, that, you know, was still quite an ad hoc thing that we did. We did, you know, whenever, we felt like it when we could, but it wasn't a structured thing. And then as Harry said, we had a new website um, design in March of this year, and that actually gave us the opportunity to filter in um, content into these topic pages. And a topic page like this LGBTQ page collects all of the editorial about a single topic, and we could choose whatever those topics were. So suddenly we had a home for these different diverse pieces of, of editorial. Um, so we created a bunch more LGBTQ content, but we still felt that this wasn't uh, structured enough. So that's why um, Mareka and Isabel started with a proposal called the, the Diverse Histories Proposal um, to really put this into uh, our editorial strategy and make this part of our systems of, of how we create editorial. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to Mareka to talk a bit more about, uh, about her experience. Yeah, um, so as Yolan mentioned, um, Isabel and I uh, started uh, with um, a proposal uh, for uh, diverse histories and inclusion uh, to put more of a focus on these underrepresented communities um, in our editorials. Um, but when I actually first started um, working in the collections engagement team, and had the opportunity to uh, start writing editorials. I also noticed that, yes, we have this, uh, um, this quote about um, um, highlighting the diversity and richness of Europe's uh, cultural heritage, but I personally felt that we weren't actually doing so much around that. And Europe's cultural heritage, you know, um, is uh, kind of something that actually represents uh, the history of the world. Europe has, you know, impacted the world a lot and uh, people have migrated to Europe and brought their own cultures and generations of um, children have uh, been born in uh, different European cultures, uh, European communities and, um, you know, changed and evolved uh, Europe's cultural heritage. So I felt that that was actually not at all represented in a lot of the um, editorials that we were promoting. And in the beginning, of course, I just started in the team and I, it wasn't a question I felt comfortable asking uh, us why we weren't doing much more on this. But I also noticed that we lacked a lot of content, a lot of diverse content on Europeana itself. Um, and so I think that also factored into why that was something that wasn't being done um, a lot but I decided to take it upon myself to actually uh, use any opportunity I could to uh, write some editorial on uh, people of the African diaspora. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, for Women's History uh, Month and campaign last year, um, wait a second, this is going a lot faster than I thought, okay, well, uh, you guys have seen quite a few editorials, but I will uh, just mention them quickly as I didn't expect them to go this um, fast. But for uh, the Women's History Month and campaign last year, I wrote a blog on uh, Josephine Baker because again, all the uh, women um, that we were uh, promoting, the editorials we were doing on them were all white focused and I, didn't, I felt like it lacked uh, diversity. So I kind of wanted to write something about a woman entertainer who really um, promoted uh, social justice and did 
quite a bit um, outside of the USA to kind of uh, make people aware about how much um, uh, people were being oppressed uh, and segregated, not just uh, the black community, but actually a lot of non-white people in the US were dealing with a lot of oppression. And she really brought that out a lot. She was also um, a freedom fighter, a spy for France in World War II and adopted so many children of different ethnic backgrounds just to prove that people could live together in harmony despite of their um, color of the skin and their background. So if we go to the next slide, um, for Black History Month uh, last year, I wanted to shed a bit more light on the history of Black History Month in the UK, why it was an extremely important moment for the UK to um, highlight successes and achievements of Black people, especially for their youth to have a sense of pride and a sense of purpose in uh, a country where a lot of um, the um, promotions were mostly focused on uh, white voices and white stories. Um, so if we continue to the next uh, slides, um, this was a gallery done by uh, our colleague Isabel on uh, black musicians. Um, and the next slide, uh, Yolan. Um, and uh, for uh, the Pride Month uh, this year, I, I also wrote a blog on Alvin Ailey just to shed a bit more light on the um, on black uh, gay men as well because um, it was great that we did something uh, for uh, Pride Month as a whole. And again, the editorials were still focused on white voices and I wanted to bring a bit more diversity into um, the editorials we were writing. So if we continue and same with this blog with uh, about Anna Mae Wong who had to um, struggle to uh, get away from the stereotypical dragon lady roles she had to play in the US and Hollywood at the time as well. Um, so um, what I wanted to also mention was that last year we did a whole campaign on Women's History Month and it was quite a success. And as I already mentioned, a lot of, a lot of our editorials were focused on uh, white women and lacked a lot of diversity. But what was interesting was that on the pro side, on our pro website, we actually did quite a bit on um, quite a lot of interviews with uh, women in uh, culture and tech. And these women were actually very diverse. They, they came from a lot of different uh, backgrounds and they were uh, ethnically very uh, different from each other as well. And I think that also brought a wider audience our way. And personally, I felt that that was a lot more representative of real modern life and um, real uh, women as well. Um, and this is the kind of uh, thing that we realized we really want to do more of, of course, bring more diversity in the type of editorials we write, but also um, promote and uh, allow ourselves to be a platform where people of different backgrounds can come and shed a light on what they're doing and in that way make our audiences feel like they are also represented in what we do. Um, and that's where um, the, our editorials kind of uh, uh, came about, our, uh, our um, proposal uh, to, to focus more on different underrepresented groups, which Yolan will talk to you more about. Yes, thank you. Um, so we've been talking about the different kinds of editorial that we have already created and what we want to continue to create. Um, but uh, I did want to um, pause for a minute for a minute to talk about what exactly we mean with the words diversity and inclusion that we've been we've been using um, through this presentation. Um, we really wanted to focus on a few underrepresented communities whose voices are otherwise not very much heard um, in society, in editorial, and, uh, and in your piano as well. So we, we've made an initial you know, list just of, of uh, groups we wanted to focus on, um, which is what we meant with uh, bringing more diversity into your piano. But um, the inclusion part of it is very important as well, because we don't want to feel um, like uh, these groups are brought in, we create some editorial about uh, the disabled community, for instance, and then, you know, our work is done, great, we're diverse. 
um, just like the LGBTQ topic page that I showed earlier, um, we don't want this to be an isolated part of your Piana or of our editorial. We want to really bring them into the fold and make them part of our core belief system, of our core um, ethic um, in, in your Piana. And um, I, th I think an important uh, term to keep in mind there as well is that we try to work as intersectionally as possible where intersectionality is the um, not only highlighting a single piece of someone's identity but highlighting the complex interplay of different identities that someone holds so um, Mareka talked about Alvin Ailey which was a, a beautiful um, piece of editorial um, but that, that blog about Alvin Ailey was a really good example of intersectionality, where not only um, was he a, a, a black man, uh, but he was a gay black man in the US, a migrant, um, part of the, the dance community. So that is really what we mean with intersectionality, with making people feel um, like they are really included into, uh, into everything we do. Um, so I think it would be a disservice uh, to present at a, at a Finnish conference and not mention uh, one of those groups that, that we also think is really important, which are the Sami people. Um, Harry said that we have about 1.5 million um, Finnish related objects in Europeana. Um, a lot of that content is also about Sami people. So we'd love to create stories, editorial narratives around this super interesting culture um, but of course, we don't have that experience, that lived experience or that expertise in our team. So we don't feel comfortable to, buy, to write a piece of editorial about the Sami people just by ourselves. So we would really like to invite people from those communities, um, take them into the fold to um, really highlight stories in a way that um, is culturally appropriate as well. So um, I do think that we have a great position in your piano to highlight those kinds of stories because not only do we have Sami content from Finland but we also have um, content from Scandinavian countries from um, from Norway and, and uh, uh, Sweden uh, that are also related to to the Sami so that richness and diversity of content we really want to show in editorial as well and um, if you'd like to talk about this more at the end of the of the presentation um, We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, observations that, that we had and, and possible actions that we could take um, based on those observations. Um, I forgot if you wanted to talk about diverse editorial, Marika, or if it was yeah. me. <laughs> so um, yeah, as Yolan uh, mentioned, um, our focus uh, kind of came from our editorial side, wanting to create more um, diverse editorial. And what we also wanted to do here is kind of use this code of culture um, um, on diversity uh, to kind of uh, put them in four foc our four focus groups just to kind of show and explain how intertwined a lot of uh, the things that we want to do are and that actually starting from the editorial, there is so much so many more aspects to it than just that. So as I said, we wanted to start from uh, the editorial side. We want to diversify our editorial, but we realized that actually that also entails um, having more diverse content in our um, in Europeana collections itself. So if you go to the next slide, um, Yolan, yep. that um, having more uh, diverse content also means working with our partners. Um, to get that content in your piano. And that also means working with our data partner services team uh, who actually are the bridge there and uh, help us get that content into uh, your piano. Yep, yeah, so, so some of the ways that we would like to tackle that is um, by, as said, inviting and supporting these new voices. Um, and by supporting, uh, we are really still trying to figure out what that support um, uh, how we can give that support, not only by giving them our platform as Europeana um, to uh, to show these stories, but um, I personally feel that we should also always support um, the voices that we invite financially. Um, that's still a conversation that is ongoing currently um, in our in our organization. So having uh, your thoughts on this as well uh, would be great. And then a second thing 
thing that we do and have already done are these campaigns and these seasons. Um, so the Women's History Campaign or the Women's History Month campaign has already been highlighted. The Migration Campaign has. So we really want to continue um, working on this because we, we find that it is very, um, it, it works very well and really brings a lot of audiences in. Um, so language sensitivity is another thing that um, is important to us. Um, we have found that uh, some of the content in Europeana uh, still uses outdated language or language that is now seen as offensive, but in a historical context was seen differently. So um, one of the examples I wanted to give was that uh, I recently published a blog about uh, sign language. Uh, so this was a, a blog about the, the deaf community and how sign language evolved throughout, throughout history. Um, I thought a very interesting topic and it was a, a cool blog, um, but we had some images in there that still used um, outdated language for the deaf community, um, mostly saying the deaf and dumb community. And, and that word dumb is really not used and seen as offensive uh, today in, uh, in deaf culture. Um, but at the time, that was how people described people that were hard of hearing and deaf. So we really want to try and figure out how do we deal with these kinds of, um, this kind of language, these words that we currently wouldn't like to use um, uh, and change. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so that's one of those questions we have. Um, so we thought that a good way of doing that would be creating a language policy and actually that's also part of uh, our proposal um, to get in more content um, because we noticed that of course we have outdated uh, terminologies on Europeana and the more content we get into Europeana we will also probably have to deal with uh, new content coming in with some outdated terminologies and working with our data per uh, data uh, partner services team and aggregators on figuring out what um, what that uh, language policy entails, what kind of language, uh, what kind of things we would tell our partners is okay uh, to use or can they, should they provide context to these old offensive terminologies, terminologies or not. And part of it is not only just based on the content on our website or content coming in, but also um, is a bit wider than that and in a way um, should be uh, incorporated also with our uh, editorials and uh, talking about a language guideline around that as well, because uh, we realize that um, some of the language we use might be seen as offensive. Um, we we ourselves uh, don't always know everything that's um, offensive and you know language uh, evolves as well and new things become um, offensive to uh, different groups of people and we need to be a lot more aware of that as well if we ourselves want to consider ourselves um, diverse and we really want to uh, support that community we need to uh, make sure that our language policy incorporates not only the collections um, uh, content, but also the way we uh, we create our editorials and our articles and make sure that we are respectful of um, people. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one thing that has already been mentioned a few times is the topic of accessibility, of having as low a barrier for people with that are differently abled or, or are disabled um, to make sure that they are also welcome and they can consume the same um, amount of content in the same way that we do. Um, we've put it in the middle of this of this uh, uh, this chart because it really affects almost every part of, of, uh, of our work and of our processes. So um, accessibility can be accessibility to the website. You, you know, is there enough color contrast between the foreground and background between the text and images? Do we have all text on our images that um, make sure that if a screen reader app goes through it that um, our content is is uh, well presented um, that is i guess the, the the program part of accessibility but it's also about accessibility to our events to um, uh, our, our different webinars our conferences um, and accessibility to the, uh, the the different parts of european our different communities and uh, advisory boards, things like that, that it's really something that pervades all of the work we, we do. 
Um, and for that, actually, we started a cross team um, a couple of weeks ago, um, specifically for this. And um, we started discussing um, how accessible our website is. It is accessible, actually, but there's still a lot more we can be doing around that. And um, that conversation also went into our pro website and how we can make that more accessible, as well as what Yolan just mentioned, that there's so much more to it than just what our uh, developers can do themselves, but what we can do in our collections team when we're writing our editorials, we need to be aware of um, these things as well. Um, also for events, we need to be a bit more aware of how accessible our events are, physical and also online events. And this is something that actually um, the whole organization needs to uh, think about and not just one, one group of people within our team. Um, and so leading on to that, we realized that as we say, we uh, want um, more diverse uh, editorials, but also more um, to get more people uh, and support more diverse voices and just make our uh, collections more diverse. That also, in our opinion, needs to be reflected uh, internally as well. Are we a diverse organization? Um, I personally feel that if we were, I think a lot of the things that we are trying to do would have been done um, a lot easier and maybe even a bit sooner as well. Um, for example, accessibility, if we had more, if we hired more people um, who, you know, belong to uh, the disabled community, they would be able to point out where we are, um, places that we can fix in our website. Um, also for editorials, we would be able to say, hey, um, the language you're using here is a bit offensive, let's change it. And there, there would just be a lot more, um, we would um, be able to reflect that a lot more outwardly and it needs to be reflected first internally. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we really want to critically reflect on is what our job openings look like, for instance. Um, how are they written? What language do we use? But also which channels do we share these in? Because um, this deeply affects the amount of people and the kind of people that we reach with these uh, with these hiring processes. So widening our channels um, really allows us to reach a more diverse group of people, and that's something we, we want to work on. Um, we, we know that this isn't a, a, a straightforward or an easy process, so we're also still very much um, searching in that regard. Um, as we are doing with uh, the leadership aspect of things. How do we want to take a stand? How do you want to portray ourselves as an organization? Um, where do we stand on the barricades? and uh, uh, Where don't we? Um, recently, one of our communi community channels, we encountered um, something that I would have considered as hate speech, but was part of you know one of our Europeana communities. Um, so it really led us to reflect on how we want to deal um, with incidents like these and how they reflect on us as Europeana. Um, the initial response to something like this, um, in, in my mind as well, is just wanting to remove these voices, this, this, these, these words that you, that, or people that we really think are offensive, but that's maybe not the best course of action. Um, instead, uh, maybe trying to speak to them and explaining why what they said was wrong, why, they, why their actions don't fit in Europeana, um, might be another step that we can take. So um, we started also thinking about maybe creating a code of conduct uh, on how we address uh, people within our communities, um, just to make sure that uh, people feel uh, comfortable and also safe in these uh, communities and people with uh, who might uh, say some problematic things, how, how we would address that. And I also believe that that is something that should not only be reflected uh, with how we deal with uh, people within our communities, but also internally as well as an organization. If we, if we really want to be diverse and inclusive, we also need to make sure that um, we have a, a, a good uh, code of conduct set in place for ourselves where people feel safe and comfortable. And despite uh, religious differences, despite uh, disabilities, despite uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds that they, they feel okay uh, in our um, organization and that you know employees respect each other as well. So um, in a way, we also believe that, that 
diversity needs to be reflected in uh, the speakers we choose uh, at our events. So um, we think that um, we need to make sure that we have more diverse speakers um, for our events, but also uh, the workshops that we host um, and um, make sure that also these events are accessible as well, um, physically and online to um, different groups of people. Um, one of the ways where uh, we are starting to reflect more on this is also for Europeana uh, 2020, where we are trying to critically reflect uh, on the cultural heritage sector. And uh, we are inviting people to uh, enter a discussion with us on uh, what privilege is and uh, in regards to access to culture, but also uh, start discuss discussions on uh, social justice as well. So that's one aspect of what we are doing in uh, Europeana 2020. Yeah, so, so with Europeana 2020, that really is in the front of our mind and we're, we're reflecting on this um, as well as we can and, and also trying to learn from this. We realize that often when we um, want to invite people or we are creating a new board or a new advisory team, um, we unconsciously or consciously um, mostly look within our current network and invite people that are already within that network to join those kinds of teams. Um, so we want to kind of break out that mold and invite people from outside of, of our network into, um, into our kind of in-group. Um, so it's, it's something that we are trying to learn from currently. Uh, we want to recognize the biases that we have there and um, hopefully mitigate them as well. Um, so in our educational content as well, we want to have very diverse learning resources. So everything that we have talked about, we of course want to extend to uh, the children we reach as well and the students we reach. Um, we really want that every student can recognize themselves, themselves in the learning resources that we provide and we create. Um, so we, we therefore think that it's important to also show these underrepresented voices from history and not only present the colonial white, um, you know, victory side of history, let's say, uh, European centric um, part of, uh, of education. So uh, that's why you want to bring these different perspectives to the forefront. Um, so our colleague, uh, Isabel, who's working on the educational side of things, um, is also working on um, having um, um, teacher ambassador and eight user uh, groups who are experts on diversity and inclusion and who will be uh, working on creating some uh, materials around that uh, for education. And on the side of that, as we continue to make uh, editorials that are uh, more diverse of these underrepresented groups that we already uh, mentioned, those will be also used in the uh, Europeana education, uh, educational community as well. Um, so what I also want to mention here is that as uh, you can see, a lot of these things kind of intertwine with each other. Um, we of course believe that starts with leadership uh, internally as well, how diverse we are, um, the content we get into Europeana, the editorials, uh, making sure everything we do is around accessibility, uh, the speakers we invite to um, our events as well. Um, the educational materials we use uh, should be diverse. And in a way we feel that that would also, that will strengthen um, um, the kind of audience we have, um, the diversity of audience we have, and will also kind of strengthen our relationship with our audiences and make sure that they feel that they're part of a, a community um, and an actual real diverse uh, community. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you, um, I'll look at this huge board that we now have for uh, for another second or two because we have our, our last Mentimeter question coming up and it is really about this. Um, we want to ask you what action that you think um, you could take now or, or maybe you have already taken to create more diversity and inclusion um, in your organization, in your um, direct surroundings. Um, so please go back to Menti and uh, I'll... I'll uh, put the question up on screen now. So th the last question we wanted to ask of you and hopefully it sparks some conversation is 
what do you think is the most impactful action that you or your organization could take right now to create more inclusion and diversity in the workplace? So um, this is a, a free text field. Um, feel free to, to put in whatever thoughts you have or actions that you think um, you could take or, or maybe are already working on. Um, so this is on the same mentee as we used before, um, 1903. Seven, eight, one. And um, I would also love to take this time to at least thank everyone for being here and listening to us ramble on for uh, three quarters of an hour. Um, and I see that there's already quite some, uh, some text being put into the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll have a read through those. So seeing some answers that we, that we highlighted in the presentation as well, exhibition policies, um, I'm, I'm going to assume that is about more physical exhibitions or maybe also digital ones. Um, it, it's something that we're looking at as well. Um, more diverse hiring processes for sure. Um, communication elements, so people communicate more and more frequently, yes. Um, Digitization of the collection uh, is a really great way to lower the barrier um, for anyone to to uh, uh, look at the, the great content you have. Recruitment practices. So what I'm mostly seeing is exhibition and collection policies on one hand and recruitment hiring processes on the other. Starting project with uh, minorities as representatives, for sure. Um, multilingual policies, yes. Um, including minorities and their voices. Um, I think it's, it's great to see that we're thinking in the same, along the same lines or in the same ways as well. So this really, um, yeah, this, this, this really helps us to see, to see your, uh, your input as well. So um, let's open the chat. Great. I don't know if Harry's still here, but he uh, has to leave. So thank you, Harry, so much for joining and your introduction. So while this is scrolling along, if anyone has any um, other questions or would like to open up a conversation, um, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, it's super interesting to see what everyone is putting into Menti. So re recruitment practices and hiring processes is something that I think it's really important and, and I'm, I'm sure Marek thinks as well, but uh, I think it's such a hard thing to really to really work on or to really think about um, uh, just because it's such a powerful thing. You know, it is about bringing new people into your organization um, and thinking about how the people that are already in your organization, um, how they create this safe space. So... Mm -hmm. um, and if, if this is Christina, if I may, may comment, I, I think in Finland, as we are so far in the north, uh, so this is a bit new. To us. Mm. Of course, we have sort of diverse communities. We, we have disabled uh, communities and, and so on. But sort of uh, in, in major scale, we are in a different position than, for example, you in the Netherlands. So, mm -hmm. so this is the thinking is a bit new, I, I would say, to, to us. But we, we... Yeah, for sure. I think um, a big part of this is. Uh, uh, recognizing the diversity that already is in your society, you know, or, yeah. or maybe even the lack of diversity. And um, that can lead you to reflect on why, uh, you know, if this diversity is also reflected in your organization or not. Um, so in, in your Piana, we, I would say we're already um, on quite a good path just because we're a European organization. We speak English in our organization, so that really attracts a lot of people from different countries. And we are a, a uh, an organization with actually mostly 
um, migrant uh, people or, or migrant staff. So we do have quite some diversity in, in our organization already. Um, something that I still struggle with is, is how we can really create a safe space for everybody to feel as heard because there's even if in a very diverse organization we have very different voices from different political backgrounds mm -hmm. um so so that is um something we're struggling with for sure yeah yeah actually earlier this morning there, there was one question related to sign language so mm. sort of we are, of course, we are facing this kind of, as, as you mentioned, we, we have in our society, of course, these kind of questions. But, yeah. uh, perhaps we haven't discussed them so much until yeah. now, but uh, let's, let's hope that the discussion now, now starts. Yes, the, the, the discussion on sign language is an, is an interesting one also for, so for Europeana 2020, which is coming up next month. Um, I don't think we have sign language interpreters in our sessions mm -hmm. to have people that are hard of hearing or deaf mm -hmm. be able to to join, um, which is also a very hard thing in in a in a digital uh, way as mm -hmm. well. If you have a physical event, you hire a person that comes in and and they do the interpreting, but um, in a digital space, I think you need to figure this out still a bit more. Um, but I'd love for us to to work on that more and and be able to, um, for instance, get interpreters in. Okay, but do you think could we now move to questions? For sure. We if have some questions in, in the chat. Yeah. First of all, I, I'd like to know sort of what kind of feedback from from your co communities have you received after after you have introduced this uh, this diversity actions and, and these exhibitions? Has it been positive? Have there been diverse feedback? So how's the situation? So specifically. On diversity, we have mostly worked on this internally. We have asked some input from from other uh, people in our community as well, which mostly has been very welcoming and uh, uh, encouraging. Actually, most of the the feedback that I remember reading or receiving was that um, it was about time that we started work on this, so that there was a lot of there were a lot of voices saying, yes, we've been highlighting this for a long time now and we haven't, um, uh, we feel like there hasn't been enough action yet. So we're happy that you're doing this and here's a list of things that we think are important and actions that you should okay. take, which I so think I, is very inspiring. I, I was relating to, to Marike, especially sort of mm -hmm. she reported on some exhibitions and sort of uh, this, this was my basic question. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose so, you Awesome. Um, for sure, there was um, there was definitely some uh, quite positive um, um, reviews uh, from our audiences, especially when we promoted these uh, these blogs um, exhibitions also on uh, social media. Um, and um, what again? So there is there was definitely a lot of uh, positive social media stuff. It, it, um, the 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 campaign mentioned on uh, Women's History Month had huge success. I think even though it ran for a month and a lot of our campaigns uh, run a lot longer and I think it just generated so much more, um, so much more um, um, attraction than a lot of things we did before. Um, we did run a campaign on uh, migration where we invited people to share their migration stories and um, on Europeana and that was also interesting because that was literally us engaging with actual public and uh, those stories were very interesting and we heard from the people themselves how they got quite emotional uh, sharing these stories uh, with us as well and it was even therapeutic for them as well so in in that way it's quite interesting how we can promote our editorials and get a reaction from the audiences but also engage our audiences on a personal level and have them feel like this is something you know that also helps them being able to share their story with us and have people being able to read um, their story so i'm not sure if i answered your question completely but yes thank you let's let's go to the chat and there's one one question related to gdpr so how that uh, affects your possibilities to create exhibitions and, and uh, treat materials. Hmm, that is uh, an interesting one. Not, none, not 
uh, me and Norma Reka are lawyers, but of course we we have to deal with GDPR on a daily mm. basis because we have a lot of communities and mailing lists that need to opt in or opt out. Um, GDPR, when it comes to editorial, isn't something that uh, we have a lot of issues with. Um, so where mm. GDPR could come in when we're creating an exhibition or a blog, um, I imagine could be if we, for instance, use a picture of someone who's uh, an image that is freely reusable, but the person in the image um, co contacts us and says, we don't want to be shown here, um, which they have the right through uh, the right to through GDPR. And those things are mostly handled on a case to case, case by case basis. And um, I, I think we're very good in taking down things that people don't feel um, they want to have shown an editorial whenever we get that message. Yeah, um, we've, had, we've had people share some stories with us and then at a later date come back and say, hey, actually, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I actually don't want my story to be on your piano anymore. And we, of course, take it down immediately. Yeah, so uh, we uh, that's through our, our user-generated user content where users can create their own stories and put them up on your piano. So they often then also share their own content uh, with images or objects where that are important to them. So of course, it's important that they keep the the ownership, I guess, over the digital version, versions of those objects as well. Um, I saw another question in the chat about Sami language, uh, which I think is interesting. So the question was from Tina Maria, and it says, as this is a Sami languages week, do you have any content in any of the Sami languages? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting because I don't know the answer to it. Um, I don't speak Finnish. I don't honestly don't know what the Sami languages look like, um, if I'm honest. So I wouldn't be able to uh, to see the difference personally because we, we have filters on different languages, but we don't have a filter for Sami. We have a filter for yeah, Finnish. Yeah. Actually, there are several Sami languages. So, and it's totally go. different from yeah. Finnish, Finnish language. Yeah, so, so that is... Uh, one of the examples where we clearly don't have the expertise and the experience on this and where we will need people from other communities to come in that do have this expertise because I personally uh, am clearly not in a, in a great position to create these, these kind of stories, but we do want these narratives on your piano. Yeah, there's quite a lot of texts in, on, on chat I'm trying to, mm -hmm. to focus on. It's about semantic analysis mm -hmm. are relevant in safeguarding linguistic accessibility of cultural heritage, machine translation, and speech service applications. But no, actually, no, there, there was no question yeah. in this. It was sort of text. Okay, so I, I'm sure we, we could discuss a long while, but for sure. thank you for you. This was a great. Great presentation, uh, very inspiring, and uh, surely we will be talking about these topics later. So thank, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah, ja, ja mood meillä alkaa nyt lounastauko, so it's lunch break, and we continue at 12. No, no, at, at one o'clock, 1 p.m. Yhdeltä jatketaan. Eli kiitokset kaikille ja pitäkää Zoom päällä niin kuin oli ohjeistus. Bye. Have a great conference, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye. Thank you for attending.